inability of the United States to uh, finally complete the licensing process for a permanent disposal site of high-level nuclear waste, that is spent fuel, which has half-life of tens of thousands of years, means that all of the spent fuel that we've generated from our nuclear reactor since the inception of the nuclear age continues to be stored on, on site all over the country in swimming pools in people's neighborhoods. Welcome to the Business Ownership Podcast, brought to you by Awareness Strategies, helping you navigate the waters between entrepreneurship and ownership. Hey there, peeps. This is Michelle Nedelec, and I'm super glad that you're here with us today because I'm here with my most amazing guest, Howard Howard. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Hey, Michelle. Thanks. Great to be here. Pleasure to join you. Excellent. So give everybody the highlight of who you are and what you do for business. Well, my name's Howard Crosby. I've uh, had a 40-year career as an executive and a developer of projects in both oil and gas and mining all across the United States and other parts of the world, including South America. So I've I've had a varied and interesting career and uh, currently involved in uh, a very exciting project in southwestern Indiana with a company that my partner and I formed a couple of years ago. But the other interesting tidbit you may be interested in, Michelle, is... Uh, <clears throat> My late uncle was the legendary American entertainer, Bing Crosby. Fun. And, uh, listeners often find that an interesting tidbit. So I threw that out there. <laughs> I didn't know Bing sung about oil and gas. and <laughs> He sung about just about everything. As just, a matter it was of fact. white and, Christmas. So, you know. In fact, he, he had a song that he recorded in the 70s called There's Nothing That I Haven't Sung About, which is really quite clever. <laughs> covers all sorts of topics, but uh, I'm not sure oil and gas was in there. Although <laughs> no. he had uh, he had uh, substantial investments in oil and gas wells in Southern California in the 30s, so he wow. was he was an investor in oil and gas for sure. That's awesome. So your project now, what are you focused in on as a project now that you're working on? So we we uh, my partner and I had, had a very successful company about 20 years wow. ago that we took from a a very small market cap in 2001, and we grew it up and sold it off for a huge gain five years later. And in the fall of 2021, we sort of feel felt like it was a really good time to get back in the business. Mm -hmm. So we formed a company, LGX Energy, and we're focused on a project in southwestern Indiana, which is part of the Illinois Basin. Um, that's one of the oldest oil provinces in U.S. history. It's actually where... Um, in 1890, John D. Rockefeller discovered the first 100 million barrel oil field in southeastern in eastern Indiana, and it was the basis of his multi-billion dollar fortune back in the day. But uh, cool. throughout the basin, which covers most of the state of Illinois and the south, south southwestern part of Indiana and the western part of Kentucky, uh, there's been you know billions of barrels of oil and trillions of cubic feet of gas that have been produced over the last 125 years. So there's a well-established industry infrastructure in Indiana and throughout the Illinois basin. Um, but we feel we felt like there was an especially interesting opportunity here in this four county region that we're operating in for a lot of reasons, not the least of which was we got ourselves uh, in possession of, we acquired some, some older seismic, which kind of showed us a lot of different formations that had never been adequately developed. So we're uh, we're proceeding ahead and very excited about it. Very cool. So this is the point where I'd ask you, okay, so what made you get into oil and gas? And why was this interesting? <laughs> but you brought well, up some awesome points. So go ahead and whatever you left out. Yeah, you know, I, I, I got involved in natural resource development because uh, I graduated from college from the University of Idaho with a bachelor's degree in history and no idea what I was going to do. And I ended up getting hired by a uranium mining company uh, back in 19, in the early 1980s. And uh, that got me exposed to energy. And one thing led to another, and I've been involved in all sorts of things since then. But you know, oil and gas obviously looks very appealing right now. Um, it always feels comfortable to be pursuing something that Warren Buffett is investing heavily in. Um, it, it's, the it's a comforting of factor to, to know that, that he's... <laughs> It's a comforting factor to know that he's just invested $40 billion of Berkshire Hathaway's capital in the oil sector in the last six months. So uh, I think our timing's pretty good. We've seen a pretty sharp rise in the oil price in the last few weeks. And uh, part of it's due to structural 
deficits, but part of it's possibly due to uh, concerns about what's going on in the Middle East. Hopefully I wouldn't get into the whole <laughs> thing of it, but you brought him up, so I'm going to go there. Sure. So he has been a huge advocate of alternative uh, energy sources and has spent a lot of money in trying to shut down oil and gas companies. So any idea what made him change his mind? Uh, reality, I think. Um, <laughs> his his jet. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, yeah, just just the reality that that society can't function without substantial contribution from fossil fuels, and and this is one of the things that I find so uh, disturbing is that you know people don't understand. I'm just going to give you a couple of facts, Michelle, that you yep. might find interesting. You know, in <clears throat> in 1900. 94% of the American workforce was involved in subsistence farming. Uh, today, uh, less than 2% of our workforce is involved in farming. Mm -hmm. Much larger farms, obviously, but the much, much, much smaller workforce that we have in farming today produces orders of magnitude greater output of food of all types than 94% uh, of our workforce did back in 1900. And the reason for that is, can be summed up in two words, fossil fuels. Because it's it's oil, uh, gasoline and diesel powering tractors and combines and mechanized farm equipment that makes farmers vastly more productive than they were 125 years ago. But even more important, and this is something that I think a very small percentage of your audience probably realizes, but the reason that we're able to feed nearly 8 billion people on this planet today is because of fertilizers based on natural gas. If you take away natural gas-based fertilizers, most of the planet is going to starve. Uh, our fertilizers are derived from natural gas and potash, but potash isn't entirely suitable for all applications. And most of the nitrogen that's provided for farms is derived from natural gas. So, you know, whether we like it or not, fossil fuels are essential for civilization and society. Well, I think there's a lot of intellectual conversations that need to be had that a lot of people are not investing in <laughs> to be able to understand what the uh, reality of their situation is. Oh, I, I absolutely <laughs> agree. You know, and with, with, <laughs> without yeah. getting into any, without trying to, <laughs> you know, make any negative aspersions on anybody, but, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, a lot of people, I think, that that uh, are driving electric cars mm -hmm. feel like that they're doing something wonderful for the environment and whatever. And I'm certainly not opposed. Anybody that wants to drive an electric car, it's fine. Go mm -hmm. ahead. I like electric cars and electric trains and environmentally <laughs> friendly because in, in about, oh, I guess, about 40 of the 50 states in this country, Mm -hmm. If you're driving an electric car, depending on what's being used to charge the battery in that electric car, you'd be more carbon neutral if you drove an efficient uh, Toyota gas engine that got 35 miles to the gallon because of what's being used to charge the battery in your electric car. And, and then you, you that's before you even talk about the environmental problems with electric vehicles. Um, which are substantial, but, you know, I don't know if you drive an electric car or gas car. I drive a gasoline-powered, efficient uh, Hyundai. But when I get rid of that car and it goes to the junkyard, my gas tank is not particularly toxic. Mm -hmm. The gasoline will all be gone. It'll be metal. They'll melt it down and recycle it. But when the batteries reach the end of their useful life in an electric vehicle, they're a terribly toxic witch's brew of noxious noxious metals that have to be disposed of in a landfill. Um, so, you so know. I think you might know the answer to this, and this is <laughs> totally left field from where we're going, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Sure. Is um, compared to nuclear reactors, when the uranium is done and and it's um, it's it's finished, it's had its spent fuel. Like, yes, they have mm -hmm. to do something with that. Compared. Can you compare the two, a use lithium battery and the post-use uranium, as far as what it takes to be able to um, contain it 
so that we can deal with it when we can deal with it. Is that in okay, your foray so, or is that like totally? <laughs> no, that's a really, it's a really interesting question and it could lead us into a two hour discussion. <laughs> exactly. My, uh, my late brother-in-law who passed away just short of his 90th birthday was the former assistant secretary of energy for the United States for nuclear. And he wrote like six books. And one of his more recent books about seven or eight years ago was called Nuclear Waste in Your Backyard. And what he pointed out was that the inability of the United States to uh, finally complete the licensing process for a permanent disposal site of high-level nuclear waste, that is spent fuel, which has half-life of tens of thousands of years, means that all of the spent fuel that we've generated from our nuclear reactor since the inception of the nuclear age continues to be stored on, on site all over the country in swimming pools in people's neighborhoods, rather than putting it in long-term deep cavern uh, salt dome storage in a permanent repository, which is what the law called for until it was suspended a few years back. So that book makes for fascinating reading. But depending on what part of the country you're in, Odds are you've got some high-level nuclear waste stored in a surface swimming pool at a, at a nuclear reactor that may or may not be abandoned at this point or on long-term decommissioning. Uh, that's where they keep it because we've never solved the problem of permanent disposal. Now, France, again, I'm getting pretty far into the weeds here, Michelle, but Sorry. you <laughs> asked, so you're going to get the answer. <laughs> France, which... Um, derives over 80% of its of its energy from nuclear. Mm -hmm. uh, they've solved the problem long ago of disposal of high-level nuclear waste. They simply encase it in glass in a process called vitrification, mm -hmm. and they drop it into the ocean, into a deep channel, where it goes down you know, several thousand feet, mm -hmm. where there's no life. And anybody that knows anything about radiation shielding knows that next to lead, mm -hmm. Water is the best mechanism for shielding radiation. So if you have two or three feet of water on top of a highly radioactive spent fuel rod, those gamma rays aren't going anywhere. They're attenuated by the water. Yeah, so so kind of like the Titanic was isolated, sort of. I mean, I, mean, I yes. get it. It was because of cold water and blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> you well, know, just you the depth, just the depth of the water it. and the and the <laughs> and the shielding effect of the water solved the problem for disposal of waste in France. Oh. Well, how fun is that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, so we can I could take a whole <laughs> university degree out of you. I won't do that to you. Let's go back to your investment opportunities in Indiana, because I have never thought of Indiana as being the hot spot of oil and gas, seeing as I don't know if you know this, but I'm in Calgary. Uh, so ah, well, that certainly is, is a hot. That is a hotbed of oil and gas for Canada, <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. And uh, without trying to make you too jealous, because I know winter's coming there in Calgary. I'm in <laughs> Palm Desert, here. California, where we don't do winter anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, no, Indiana's had a long history going back to the 1890s, yeah. uh, and the Illinois Basin, as I said, has had a long history. But um, our company is focused in a, in really a four county region in southwestern Indiana. Um, Clay County, Vigo County, Greene County, and Davies County. And uh, we acquired some seismic that was shot there about 15 years ago that's given us a real leg up on identifying drilling prospects. And then we're reconfirming that with uh, even more modern three-dimensional seismic. Um, so we've got a very exciting opportunity and we're doing a Reg A right now. Uh, people can read all about us. We've got a nice website, lgxenergycorp.com. Awesome. And uh, and that will give you an invitation to one of the webinars that I do where I talk about oil and gas in Indiana and opportunities and, and all the reasons why we we like it there. Um, you know, there's there's uh, again, there's there, you know, a lot of people don't understand really um, the history of oil and gas in North America. I mean, it, it all kind of transferred to the southwest when Spindletop was hit the big well in Texas in the 1910 era. But actually the second largest oil province in U.S. history, believe it or not, is the Los Angeles Basin. Yeah. There's been over four and a half billion barrels of oil produced in L.A. It's, mm. a, it's been a huge productive region. So I think the Illinois Basin ranks about fourth or fifth, if I'm not mistaken. 
Nice. So talk to me about some of the benefits of of investing in oil and gas as a yeah. And, yeah, that's a good that's a very good question, Michelle. <clears throat> I think <clears throat> because oil is the is the largest and most important commodity in the world, uh, oil has uh, a world market last year of two point one trillion dollars of transactions in oil. That's more than double all metal elements combined. So if you take iron ore and gold and copper and nickel and zinc and lead and add them all together, they're less than a trillion dollars of transactions and oil was more than double that. <clears throat> also, petroleum and petroleum-derived products, or petroleum pro products derived from petroleum, uh, account for over 6,000 different products in everyday use. Uh, uh, the glasses that you and I have on were derived from petroleum. It's a good chance that some of the hair products, some of our clothes were derived from petroleum. That water bottle behind you mm -hmm. uh, was derived from petroleum. Uh, not to mention all the transportation fuels that we all in know fact, about. I would so, challenge anyone to show me anything in their life that that they have that hasn't at some point in time touched the petroleum industry and could not be made without the petroleum industry. From a agreed. fork to a uh, knife to <laughs> I do not 100%. care what it is. I mean all you know all the metal products that we that we use every day, all the everything that is made out of metal was done by mining, and the mining involved equipment that was powered by oil exactly right? even so, even if you have the most beautiful hemp field on the planet you do not run and operate it without oil and gas so yes it's i mean it you is, could do it i guess you could do it with a donkey and a handheld plow you could but what are you going to fertilize it with and then how are you going to transport it to anybody and how are you going to transport it to market yeah that's right <laughs> it's, yeah, it's exactly not going to happen so, so the world has moved on and i think we need to one, accept the fact that everything we use is, okay, great. Now, what is the main objective here? What are we really trying to do with things? Because I think, too, there's a huge misunderstanding between dirty burning and clean burning that allows carbon dioxide to go into the planet, which then the trees and the plants love and eat up and <laughs> turn into and oxygen. Like, this is great for oxygen. science. Uh, for us to breathe, because that's where it comes from, right? The the atmosphere is only twenty one percent oxygen. It's be nice for the plants to keep spitting out more of it for us. <laughs> okay, and somehow, some way, and I haven't figured this out yet either. Another question I have that's been picking my brain is how is it that no matter all of the things that we do, that consistently oxygen is still at that twenty one point three or whatever it is? It's a very precise amount of oxygen in the air. Yes. So I think we we need to have better conversations, in my opinion, about uh, what do we really want to happen when we all love clean air? <laughs> yes, <laughs> clean air absolutely. I remember when water. I was a boy, good. Uh, Michelle, when I was a boy and we would visit my relatives in Los Angeles, you could hardly breathe. Right. Uh, the pollution was so bad, uh, the, the knocks and the air pollution and, you know, the Clean Air Act and the things that we've done with catalytic converters. Mm -hmm. um, now there's other things in LA that are obnoxious, but it's not the air. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go there so so when it comes to your investment opportunity what how what do you see as the future of the petroleum industry let's call it that well i mean obviously regardless of what is going on in the in the minds of people that are you know advocating that we move we move completely away from it it's just as buffett sees it's completely unrealistic uh, the oil and gas industry's future is absolutely secured for at least the next hundred years. Mm -hmm. You know, ultimately, sometime man mankind may find a way to transition away from fossil fuels to, um, uh, you know, to a hydrogen-based economy. Mm -hmm. um, hydrogen has got a lot of potential and a lot of technical and scientific issues associated with using hydrogen for energy, mm -hmm. but it has unlimited potential for sure. Um, but there will always be needs for uh, fossil fuels in a, a variety of other areas. Like, again, going back to agriculture, I don't know what we do without natural gas-based fertilizer, which is why it's kind of a shame to see us using natural gas to generate electricity. We could do that with uranium, which isn't much good for anything else, right? We can't fertilize our crops with uranium, 
<laughs> so, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. when it comes to kind of investors, are you looking for partners? Are you looking for silent investors? Are you looking for... So like, what, what we've done, for? Michelle, is we've structured our, uh, our Reg A offering as a convertible preferred stock. Okay. So uh, people buy preferred stock, it pays a 10% cash dividend on an annual basis. And uh, the shares are convertible two for one, two shares of common for each share to preferred. So we plan on taking the company into the public market sometime probably mid to late next year. And so if the stock price trades significantly above the conversion price, then uh, ultimately they could consider converting their preferred stock into common and sell it for a long-term capital gain as opposed to ordinary income. So our idea was to create a structure for investors that gives them generous current income with a big upside potential. And that's what we've done. Nice. So what makes your company kind of different than ones that are offering on the public market right now? Well, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more of a ground floor type opportunity because we've only been in business just coming up on two years. We've already accomplished a lot. Uh, I think the best thing for interested prospective investors to do would be to visit our website mm -hmm. and uh, come to come attend one of my webinars, which I talk about the whole business of the company. Uh, that's that's a 35 minute presentation in and of itself. And I'm not going to give it all here <laughs> and bore the people on your <laughs> podcast that aren't interested in oil and gas. <laughs> awesome. So. Uh, we will have that link in the show notes, of course. And is it, do they access that just off of your general website? Is there a pretty link for that? Yeah, there's just a way to access it on the website. You can, uh, you can see how to attend the webinar and then there's all sorts of other information that is easily readily, readily, readily available. <laughs> available. <laughs> what you, you uh, too many words you going on into our time. website and, <laughs> and scroll down through it, I think they'll, you'll find it quite informative. Nice. For those who are only on audio, go ahead and give that website again. Yeah, it's uh, lgxenergycorp.com. So the letter, that's uh, uh, Lima Golf X-Ray Energycorp.com. lgxenergycorp.com. Awesome. And we will, of course, have all of Howard's links in the show notes. So, so if you're on a browser, you can do that. Go ahead and scroll down, click on those links, and of course, open up into a new browser. Uh, because we're not done yet. So Howard, at this point, I get to ask you, at what point in life did you know you're a special kind of crazy enough to think that you could become an entrepreneur? Well, you know, it was it was such a long time ago, Michelle. <laughs> I, I haven't had a real job since uh, about 1982. So uh, during that course of time, I guess I've, I've been involved in starting and been involved with so many different businesses that I forgot what it's like not to do this. But um, I guess maybe I, I kind of headed off in that direction almost out of need because uh, in 1982 brought a pretty serious recession in the United States. Uh, it was clear that the job I had was not very secure at that point in time. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll strike out on my own and see if I can figure out something to do. So uh, that's probably what, what did it for me. I tell people, you know, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. I was born and raised in Spokane. And I tell people, you know, I graduated from college from the University of Idaho in 1975, and I tell people, you know, if I had had the brains that God gave a gerbil, uh, <laughs> I would have jumped in my car in the spring of 1975 and headed for California. Because A, number one, I hate snow and cold weather. And B, I had, you know, all my aunts and uncles and relatives and everybody were down here. And, you know, uh, as I mentioned, one of my uncles was a prominent movie star, and he was still alive back then. And had a lot of connections. So I may not have ended up where I am if I had done what I should have done back when I should have done it. <laughs> well, I, I think you did pretty well because you're still pretty darn fascinating. <laughs> so... <laughs> Thank you. Well, this has been fun. Yeah. Awesome. You've been absolutely awesome. Any last words for our peeps? Uh, no, just, just keep on looking for that right opportunity, folks. You know, it's fun. Nice. Love it. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And I know how valuable it is. Thanks, Michelle. Have a great day. Peeps, this is Michelle Nedelec. Thank you for being here with us today. Be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your friends. We love helping entrepreneurs grow. 
Are you running a business over seven figures but still struggling with technology headaches? Pay attention, you do not want to miss this offer. This podcast episode is brought to you by Awareness Strategies, who is offering a custom-built digital adoption roadmap for anyone running a business over seven figures who's wanting to grow their business in the next five years. And it's not just a roadmap, they offer full implementation as well. If that scares the out of you, check out awarenessstrategies.com forward slash roadmap for more details today. The link's in the show's notes. Don't regret not doing this. Do it now. That's awarenessstrategies.com slash roadmap.